So by next week, we might have a little bit more detailed information. If we remember next week to, to look at that, yes. Okay. No promises. Not with his memory right now. Nope. <laughs> okay. What are you talking about? Sharp as a tack. That's been stepped on several times. <laughs> with work boots. I think I'm done. Okay. Okay. Oh, so on the... <laughs> You're not helping here. Nope. <laughs> this was supposed to be a short podcast. Well, you could at least trim these parts. Not going to. Welcome back to another episode of This and That, a coffee chat that is once again with water uh, because it is. Hey, this is electrolytes. Let's let's be clear here, you know, living in the desert and everything. Okay, a water and electrolyte chat with the Harris. That just doesn't have the same roll off the tongue as a coffee chat it does. It really doesn't, <laughs> does it? No. Uh, one of these days we'll get back to morning uh, recording. Or yeah. we'll get a bottle of wine so we can just have a wine chat. Because that also kind of rolls off the tongue. Well, you know, um, we're going to have to do a wine chat, I, I think. Um, today just was jam-packed with other stuff. and Yeah, too much going on. You know, even though we block out the time, for some reason, other people... They also want this time from us. Yes. So, yeah. so instead, it's as the clock cleverly hidden by my glass... <laughs> Will indicate it's four thirty in the afternoon. We try to shoot these around nine o'clock in the morning, so we're only a little late today. Mm -hmm. Hey, what are we talking about today, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a small amount of economic news uh, from the past week, and then on the real estate side, we're going to go a little bit more into uh, pricing information and local Tucson uh, pricing. We have a mid-year report from Long Realty that came out that we'll talk about a little bit. Yep. And then it's Olympics. I mean, I think that's the big thing that we've been watching along with some F1 and a few other we, this and that items. We, we did have uh, some interesting events at Spa in Formula One. Yes. So we'll, we'll chat about that a little bit later. Um, Olympics, I mean, just, just today in the background we had it on and mm -hmm. uh, we had the four channel thing up. And so yeah. we had- the Two by two screen, which I really enjoy watching because- yeah. Something goes to commercial, you can pop the audio over to a different one. If something looks exciting, you can switch to that one. So at you know any given time, we had uh, men's handball, had badminton, judo, uh, some women's soccer, on. some women's soccer on. Yeah, you know, so yeah, you know, a little, little, a little of this and that. <laughs> Shameless plug. Oh, this is going to be a tough one today. I can just tell already. <laughs> yeah, well, you're tired, so that I, I does tired. not help. Well, since the economic part of it is kind of short this week, do we want to just start with that real quick? Sure, and I will cover the non-real estate piece and leave that for you. So ADP came out with their uh, payroll numbers, and uh, they came out with 122,000 new jobs in July, but that was lower than the anticipated 150,000 that uh, they were looking for. So again, another sign that while still growth, it's slowing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, based on last week's um, podcast we talked a little bit about some other indicators that might show that the economy is slowing while also having numbers showing that the economy continues to grow so very much mixed messages probably why today the fed also announced that they're not doing any rate changes uh, this month but they very strongly hinted in the press conference afterwards that september is likely to see a, a rate drop uh jerome powell was kind of clear and saying it probably won't be 50 basis points. So that probably leaves a 25 basis point reduction in September then. So, which, yay, it's the first time in a very long time since we've seen a reduction. So, so that's really good. The other thing that ADP uh, indicated that those that stayed in their jobs saw a 4.8% increase in wages in the last year. And so, 
Those that moved jobs, though, saw a 7.7% increase in wages. So keep job hopping, people. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's been demonstrated many times that being loyal to your employer is not necessarily the best way to see career growth, career path, and that people that hop around often come back to their previous employer, but in a much higher position because they've sampled other jobs on the job ladder mm -hmm. that those that stayed behind just didn't necessarily get promoted as get much because they were good, loyal folks and so on and so forth. So, Which is kind of an unfortunate situation that we have to do that to yeah. get better job options, but... Well, we don't because we're, we work we're, for ourselves. I work for myself. We're independent contractors. Yes, we are. So, uh, you know, we get paid whatever we go out and earn. So <laughs> that's true. That's the way that works for us. Anyway, so uh, there's going to be the official uh, government employment numbers coming out at the end of the week. But uh, uh, often ADP is a very good predictor of what the federal numbers are going to look like. Okay. Okay. Um, you mentioned to me earlier construction jobs. Yes. And so we, we mentioned that we wanted to keep an eye on construction. Now, construction isn't necessarily just homes. It can be road construction, you know, some of that infrastructure stuff that was passed a, a couple of years ago. We might be seeing that. But that also saw another fairly robust increase. I think it was 55,000 new jobs in construction. Uh, the one area that really took a hit was business services. Hmm. Um, and I don't know if that's the leading edge of companies starting to use more artificial intelligence to do some of those jobs. Uh, a lot of times you, you trim some of those white collar jobs in industries where you anticipate uh, decline in sales coming forward, so it might be a little bit of that also. Hmm. We know that a lot of the tech firms have been cutting for over the last year, and so that might be some of that. But construction is still real strong right now. It's interesting, yeah. given the housing sales that we saw that yes. we talked about last week. But I, I would like to see construction be broken out, broken into out into mm -hmm. so that you, you know what kind of construction we're talking about. Will the Fed data give that to us? It should, yes. Okay. Yeah. So by next week, we might have a little bit more detailed information. If we that. remember next week to, to look at that, yes. Okay. No promises. <laughs> Not with his memory right now. Nope. <laughs> okay. What are you talking about? A sharp as a tack that's been stepped on several times <laughs> with work boots. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm done. Okay. Okay. Oh, so on the... <laughs> You're not helping here. Nope. This was supposed to be a short podcast. Well, you could at least trim these parts. Not going to. <laughs> on the home sales side of things, um, we now have updated data through May of this year. So there's quite a bit of, of a lag on price appreciation data that comes out. Um, but year over year from Case Shiller, we saw another 5.9% increase on the national index. So markets are still going up. Um, their 10 city composite, so your 10 largest cities, saw a 7.6% increase. So big cities had even larger price increases in the general number. Yes. 6.7% uh, on the 20 city composite. So all of the doom and gloom of prices tanking, not really the reality of what we're seeing across the, the national averages. And, and like we talked about before, real estate is just like the weather. It, it's local. So yep. there, there are some areas that aren't doing quite as well as the, the national average. And I have a list here of the top 30 uh, decreases, change in price from their peak Yes. Uh, as a percentage. And of course, we'll throw these up uh, so that you can see them as well. But I think what's interesting out of these 30 is a lot of them are the mountain states. There are these states that saw a lot of increase um, and a lot of movement from coastal uh, states and cities 
inland and they're now starting to see somewhat of a decline. Um, so at number one, we do have Austin, which we sort of expected. They yes. really inflated during the COVID time. They're down about 14% from their peak. And, and that was one of the areas that we talked about has lots of new construction also. So you, you have those two factors going on yeah. in Austin. Yes. Um, but then after that, we have Idaho Falls down about 7.5%. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is number three. Twin Falls, Idaho, number five. Boise City, Idaho, number six. Pueblo, Colorado, number seven. Um, and then Lake Havasu City, Kingman, uh, Arizona, number 10. So you can see a lot of these top 10 are mountain states yeah. um, that are seeing and, and some decrease. From the peak. From the peak. And it's I see it more as a correction than a crash. Right. Yeah, again, we still have, with the exception of a few areas, a scarcity of homes on the market. Yeah. And so that's holding prices, but you know, we, we saw that just a little bit here in Arizona when, mm -hmm. you know, people started overpricing as homes were coming onto the market because the market was so crazy, just as it was starting to turn. Yeah. And, and that red hot demand cooled off to, you know, orange hot demand. <laughs> yeah. And we saw some of those prices having to come back down a little bit um, mm -hmm. to, to better match the market. And I think that's probably what we're seeing in some of these markets is just a little bit of adjustment to, you know, the fact that, that you know, the m amount of out migration from some of the Pacific states is slowing. Mm -hmm. And these areas that were growing really fast because they were incredibly affordable, well, they're still affordable compared to the West Coast cities, but they're, they're not as affordable. Yeah. So, and they're not as affordable to the residents that have been there the whole time. Correct. Especially if they didn't already own a home yes. before these price increases. At least if you owned a home, you got to ride that price increase for your home as well. Yes. But it's a lot tougher for those people that lived here and were renting at the time when everything went up. Yeah, exactly. I think the other thing that we're seeing, and I'm looking at our mid-year housing report for the Tucson area right now, is that we're seeing more of the seasonal fluctuation of prices. And during those COVID years, that just didn't happen. It was just up pretty much consistently. You know, every month continued to go up. There was almost no fluctuation. And yeah, those people from the West Coast states didn't understand that you don't shop for homes in the summertime in tucson <laughs> yeah you're one to talk you went under contract in august ah, details <laughs> yeah. details uh, but yes and so looking at the median home sold price trends um going back to the beginning of 2021 in tucson um for that 2021 year pretty much straight up and then uh particularly from mid 22 on we see that wave starting up again yeah and for us that kicks in a little bit sooner so our peak was may of this year that was our new tucson median high um, and we dropped a little bit in june which if you're in other places you're like that's terrible it's summer you're dropping it's maybe a month early for our decrease to start, but normally late spring, early summer is our peak price time. And then we cool throughout the summer a smidge, and then we pick up again either late fall or the beginning of the next year. And yeah. we start going up sooner than a lot of the rest of the country does just because people buy here in January and February because the weather's really nice. Yeah, we have a number of clients that we're working with that are going to be putting their homes on the market and all of them are waiting until September. Yeah, September or October. Because they've been here long enough, they know, they, they, they want as many consumers available mm -hmm. as, as possible. So, so it's, it's, it's the norm here in, in Tucson. Yeah. So year over year for Tucson, the greater Tucson area, we're up 1%. Again, this was with a decrease in June over May. So if you had looked at like May over May, I think that probably would have been a little bit more of an increase. Um, and then a lot of the surrounding suburbs are sort of in that same boat of just plus or minus a couple percentage points. Um, and then I think the other thing to highlight here and something that we've been talking about quite a bit 
is how many homes are on the market, how many new homes are coming on the market, because we've been in such a deficit for so long now. And on our little handy dandy chart here, uh, we have active residential inventory and Part of this chart is the five-year average, and they actually went back to 2015 through 2019. So our last five years of kind of a normal market. Before the unicorn years. Before the unicorn years. And uh, 2023 was below the five-year average of active inventory. 2024 is still below that five-year average. And so, we still aren't to the level of inventory that we were pre-COVID. We're just getting closer and we're up from last year. And new listings are also up. Again, this idea of how much of a lock-in rate effect are we seeing. Um, so year to date, um, Tucson as a whole is up about 18%, but that's super, again, real estate being local, super suburb and probably even more local neighborhood dependent because Oro Valley, as an example, is only up 2%. Moran is up 15%. Saddlebrook's up 43%. So those are big changes from kind of submarket to submarket as far as our new listings actually coming on the market. So there's more on this um, yeah. mid-year report. So if you do want the full version, let us know and we can and send one your way. Yeah, a yeah. copy of it. Um, but those now, are some interesting things that we've been kind of talking about here for a while. Yeah. Data is not always perfect um, as you start kind of working your way down. Right. I think it gets skewed a little bit more in some ways. The more finite you get the data. Yeah. Right. But in some ways also it can be helpful to know, you know, what's going on in a specific neighborhood. So it has its pros and cons. You just kind of have yeah. to know what you're looking at and what it's telling you yeah but generally longitudinally yeah big word um it should give you a good enough indication of of where we are and i think that the data does do mm -hmm. that and i always do the data is plural but i always do it as singular so, so the, the data don't are. don't don't <laughs> you grammar cops out there don't be writing in the the comments down there that i did the data with the wrong verb pluralization good morning this is basic english and i'm sure there will be grammar <laughs> cops that correct me that's not what it's called well, I think you've you got to check your syntax and grammar there. <laughs> I'm not sure you helped yourself with that sentence there. No, but you know, I am the guy that puts in the English as a foreign language is English drop in almost every video that we do. So <laughs> I thought that seemed familiar when I watched our last video that I had seen that. Before. Yes, yes. So and and you know, it probably is going to make an appearance <laughs> right about here. English as a foreign language is English in the video mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that one's on speed dial <laughs> yeah you save that one in the file so that it's just a drag and drop every time yes yeah yes because i know that i will mangle something mm -hmm. i blame my german mother ich bin ein violiner yes with the accent in english and in german yes mm -hmm. yes very interesting to go go see my grandparents in Germany and uh, I, even though I didn't speak German uh, listening to my mother speak to her parents and and very quickly understand that she now had an English accent in German her native tongue as well as a German accent in English when she spoke to me so um, yeah you know that hero's journey where, where you're you're no longer <laughs> That was Grandma Erica. That was Grandma Erica right there, yes, <laughs> with, the, with the English language. Well, she knew more than one language, so. She did. She did. Yes. Okay, do you have anything else on the economy or on real estate right now? Oh, Lord, no. Okay. Olympics? Olympics. I got to watch parts of eventing this weekend. 
Yeah, I was a little disappointed in the, the, the coverage because it'd be like two and a half minutes of watching somebody on the cross country course mm -hmm. and then three and a half minutes of commercials. Yeah, there were a lot of commercials. It was bad. Now, that being said, I did, I noticed that on both the dressage and the cross country um, like replay of them. I got to watch, I was able to go back and watch the show jumping piece from the original broadcast at you know, 1 30 in the morning our time and that one was a lot better. They showed a lot more riders going through before they had a commercial break. Okay. And so I haven't had a chance to go back and try to find and watch the original broadcast of the cross country. I probably won't do that for the dressage but I would like to see more of the cross country and to see if maybe that makes it a little bit better okay. because the cross country was also on that rebroadcast super short. It was, yes. it felt like it was 30 minutes and that was it. There right. were, when it takes a writer nine minutes to, to complete to the course. The course. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, that was almost nothing. Yeah. Um, but I will say I actually, you know, we talked a little bit last time about how sometimes I feel like they make courses like difficult just for the sake of making it difficult with no like real purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really feel that with the course design this time for either cross country, the little bit that I saw or the show jumping, which I saw a lot oh. more of. Um, I actually liked the design of the courses. They seemed really rideable. Um, I believe we had four people finish on their dressage score, meaning they had no faults or penalties in cross country or the two rounds of show jumping that they do if they qualified for the individual uh, additional show jumping part of it. Okay. Um, there was only one in Tokyo who finished on their original dressage score. So that tells me it probably was a little bit more rideable. Yes. Um, but they, at least on cross country, there were lots of options. Um, I didn't see enough to really see how they played out. So I, again, want to go watch that. But it seemed like it was a better course design in some ways than I think what we sometimes see. So I liked the course design. I liked the jumps. Um, I don't know if you saw the, the like deer head antler jump. I don't recall that. It was a pretty cool one. Okay. You basically jump their head and then you have antlers going up. Oh, that's pretty sides. cool. Um, so there was some cool course design on the cross country. Um, so and I liked how they had the uh, the course going across the river mm -hmm. where they had to go across the bridge and they laid down arena sand on the bridge so that yeah. the horses wouldn't slip and it was a little bit softer for them. But I, I just, it just added a little uh, aesthetic beauty t mm -hmm. to the to the ride and the course. Well, they were doing it in palaces of Versailles. In yes. The gar or the gardens. Yes. So, I mean... Of all places to get to go ride through, that was that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool, yes. <laughs> that would be fun to be competing in. Yes. So, yeah, I did enjoy watching that. I don't have any amazing Olympic observations yet. My other one, if you Okay, don't, well, you, got, you have more than one, okay. I, I do have more than one. Um, so, I don't think we'll be able to share this, so you'll have to go find this video because of the really restrictive copyright that copyright slams. NBC, yeah is doing right now in the olympics i think it's actually the olympic committee oh the olympic committee more, okay. more, much, much more so than NBC. nbc yes anyway but if you watched the men's 400 im and swimming um there was a french athlete uh competing who won gold and on the breaststroke every time he came up for a breath the crowd was like screaming his name and it was on rhythm the entire time down and back that he did that 100 meters of breaststroke and it was like okay that was cool definitely he could hear that even with swim caps and everything because it was loud a little home pool advantage there oh yeah yeah and he won by a, a decent margin um so that was cool to see that um um, let me see what other notes do I have that was I would say those are the two big highlights and then also just watching like we talked about last time some of the sports that I don't normally watch so watched a little beach volleyball watched a little rugby um, 
I haven't watched live a lot of the US gymnastics stuff, but basically every time it comes up on my feed, I like watch whatever videos come up because those have yeah. been good too. Yeah. So. Uh, we, we finally learned today how many steps you can take in handball. Oh yes, before you have to Bef pass, dribble, or Pass shoot. it to yourself. Yeah. Pass it to yourself was an option. I think th I think that's, that's a dribble. dribble. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. pass or shoot. Or shoot, yeah. yeah. Three yeah. steps. Three steps. And yeah. so that's always been a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Kind of hard to tell by just watching. So we heard the announcer say that today. And in our like, two by two, we yes. had the audio on the handball at the right time. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So oh. that was, uh, so it was, it was exciting moments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you learn the rules of obscure sports. I, I almost think that you can, if you get, you know, 10 halfway athletic people in the United States, they're going to go to the Olympics in handball because we just do not play that that sport here in the United States. And and so I don't even know if we have a, a U.S. team representing. Is there a U.S. handball league? I don't know. I mean, I'm that's sure not, there is. I'm sure there is, but it's... I don't know how professional it is, but I'm sure there... Yeah. Wait till pickleball. I mean, what the hell is pickleball? When that comes especially in the senior olympics we are going to own that sport because everybody and their brother that i know plays pickleball mm -hmm. the orthopedic surgeons love it <laughs> i was gonna say you also live in an old person community so it's a leisure community for active seniors enough of that <laughs> we prefer to say age qualified mm -hmm. the active adult community yes Yes. It, 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 not today, but we do need to tell the Grandma Erica story one of these days. Yes. Maybe for another time. Another time. It's funny. Anything else on the Olympics? Uh, other than apparently they got the river clean enough finally to allow the triathletes to compete and swim in the poo ridden Seine River. It still didn't look especially blue. No. And it makes me wonder what's going on in Paris, France, that in this day and age, you cannot have a clean river. And so, you know, comments below, if you know what the issues <laughs> are, do they not have wastewater treatment facilities in Paris? Is it, you know, the sewer systems from the 1700s still flowing into the, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer and I don't know why with many years notice that they didn't get the river clean but i i'd be embarrassed if i was paris clearly we did not research this topic before bringing it no but we to... have strong opinions <laughs> because we're americans and that's what we do be an american where at least i know i'm free <laughs> okay let's move on to the f1 race yeah. do you want to talk about spa a little bit well, yes. So, several, a couple ob observations, maybe three. Okay. You can pile in at any time. I have five notes on F1. Okay. So, Spa is one of the classic race courses. And. Yeah, I love that. Oh, uh, on Rouge. On Rouge, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the camel straight. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it, it has become apparent as classic a racetrack as Spa is, the cars have outgrown it. Mm. They cannot pass each other at that track anymore. They also shortened the DRS. Yes, yes, they did. But range on the one straight. There, there's some argument to be made that cars should be able to pass each other without okay. DRS. Yeah. Drag reduction system, in case you're wondering for those at home that don't play F1 on a regular basis. Uh, so it basically opens their back wing flaps so that they can yes, go faster. Go faster. And less drag. They have to be within this one second of the car in front of them in order to deploy. And it's it, only allowed on certain parts of the track. Yes, usually long straights. Yeah, that's the quick and dirty of what DRS is. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, you know. Some of the pundits that I like to listen to were, were talking about, you know, we have new regulations coming up and it's, it's unlikely that they're going to slow down the cars or do anything mm -hmm. that might make 
that track more raceable again. Mm -hmm. And there's already been talk about dropping Spa from the schedule because it's in a fairly remote, remote part of Belgium and it often rains, even though they changed the month that it's in, it still rained on Saturday for qualifying and whatnot. And logistically, it's hard to get people out there without long waits. Yes, it's it's very remote part of the Ardennes forest and, and I mean, it's a beautiful location, but it's hard to get 300,000 people in the weekend up there. Yeah. So that, that was number one, and it's kind of sad, uh, in, in my opinion. Observation number two is um, we thought maybe this would be the bounce back week for Checo Perez, hmm. who started on the front row and still fin finished at the back of what we call Formula A. Yeah. He was the last driver of the top teams to finish in spite yeah. of starting up front. Teams. Now, he was complaining on the radio that he was wondering if something was wrong with his battery system because he wasn't getting the the speed on the straights that he he thought he should so that might have yeah. been part of it i do wonder if something will come out i haven't seen anything in the last few days but if something will come out at some point that there was in fact an issue there yeah so there was a lot of speculation after the race whether red bull who's been ruthless with drivers in the past was going to basically demote him to the the RB team. The RB team, which is their second team. The carb. Yes, the Visa. Cash app. Racing Bulls. Yes, a horrible name. <laughs> v carb. Uh, but it was announced today or yesterday, I think it was today, that no, he's staying through the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Now, there's further spec speculation that the reason that Red Bull's keeping him is. Checo brings a boatload of sponsorship money with him. I'm in the money. Particularly when you get to North America. Yeah, I was going to say a large Mexican fan base. Yes, very large. And so I think the, the thought was he's more valuable to us doing what he's doing mm -hmm. because of what he brings to the team finance-wise. Finance yeah. So... So there's that. Um, McLaren wasn't as dominant, but I would say that... Which you anticipated last week that yes. they maybe wouldn't be as fast this this time around. Yes, although Oscar, Oscar was the fastest at the end of the race and probably needed two more laps. And my, One of my notes is Piastri is fast. Yes. <laughs> That's all I have on, on that is he, he can move. So I will leave the biggest item. You might have another item in addition to that, but the, the biggest item, and, and I'll share the quote, but go ahead. Uh, we had a winner get disqualified and lost their P1 position yes. for being underweight. Um, so to keep everything fair, there are minimum weight requirements and the car and the driver both, or combined? Car, 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 I believe it's car and driver. Um, they have to hit a certain weight. The car came under weight by one and a half kilograms. Yes. Um, and that was enough to disqualify George Russell from P1 and move Hamilton from P2 to P1. And what's interesting is as they are doing the inspections, uh, the scrutinizers, so they call them over there. Scrutineers. Scrutineers. English. English as a foreign language is English. Uh, discovered that the, the car wasn't drained of fluids properly. Mm -hmm. So it makes you think that somebody on the Mercedes team knew that the car was underweight. It's very theory. Yeah. And, uh, and so what they- a little extra fuel in there to see if it was gonna get caught. Yes. And so they, when they fully drained it, it was that uh, uh, one and a half kilograms shy of the weight. So weight loss. And what was interesting was in order for George to win the race, he took a big gamble. Mm -hmm. And every other team made two stops during the race for tires. Except Alonzo also did. Except for Alonzo, yes. 
Fernando Alonso also only made one stop. And George made the call from the cockpit, like, mm -hmm. no, I think these tires are good. Let's go try to win this thing. Mm -hmm. this, the, their simulator showed that if he pitted, he was going to finish fifth. And if he didn't change tires, he was going to drop back to fifth anyway. But George, feeling what he felt in the car, felt like, no, we'll do better than fifth. Let's, let's keep on going. It looked like it was going to be Lewis Hamilton's race mm -hmm. until George didn't pit. Right. And Lewis Hamilton was not a happy camper after the race. And so a lot of the reporters were going to Toto Wolf, the team principal, and his comment was, you know, both drivers did a great job. I really wish I, we could have two winners in this race. And sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for because he had two winners, George. And then when George was disqualified, Lewis got elevated to first place in, in the win. Yeah. So uh, I am going to be really curious as to what comes out mm -hmm. on what happened. I do wonder if that will get buried a bit with it being the summer break and not having a race this week to have reporters asking those questions. By the time reporters are in front of the teams and the drivers again, it's gonna be almost a month from now. And I wonder if there will be enough of a news cycle before then that some of this will I mean, if I'm disappear. a reporter, I, I wanna talk about this. Yeah, well, a lot can happen in a month and we're in silly season. That is true, that is true. All right, I, I think you have. Well. Silly season. That was mood. a nice segue. Yes, yeah. I, I do because Carlos is officially going to Williams, which I'm excited about, uh, unlike our silly season update from last week. Um, I think that Carlos and Alex Albon at Williams is a really strong pairing for that team. Yes. Um, I really like James as the team principal. I liked that move from pretty much the beginning. Yes. Um, when they have their little interviews with one of the team principals during the race weekends. I'm always really excited when it's James because I feel like he actually gives good answers and he like explains his answers and he doesn't give you some like nice little line that the PR team crafted yeah, and for I, him. And I'm not going to show any of my cards. Yeah. He knows they're at the back of the grid right now. I mean, he, yeah. he hopes that they're not going to be there in a couple of years, but, but he understands their place and it's like, what am I going to give up by actually sharing with the, the listeners at home yeah. what we're thinking and why we're thinking it? Yeah. Yeah. And all the other teams can see the data of what our drivers are doing right now. <laughs> yeah. There are no secrets in Formula One. Yeah. <laughs> so. So, yeah, I'm excited for that one. I think that will be a good pairing. Um, I think kind of the biggest question mark is still Adrian Newey and where is Newey going and could Williams be a potential there for him to land. I can't remember if he was on the list of teams. I know that Ferrari has been crossed off the list. So I know that I really Mercedes was one of the teams. I believe um, Aston Martin was mm -hmm. one of the contenders. Which is not surprising given the money that they have to throw around. Well, they do have the budget cap. And only driver's salaries are excluded from the driver's cap or from the salary cap. I'm sure Daddy Stroll can come up with other Bill decisions. finagle something, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, so, you know, obviously Red Bull wants to keep him because he's... Well, he's... He's the... <laughs> he said he's leaving, so... You know, <laughs> it's Formula One. Yeah. So you, you never know. Until a contract is signed and it's announced... Yeah, who knows. Even when teams announce that they have signed a driver and it turns out, well, actually, you guys never countersigned that contract. And so, no, you don't have a contract. And no, I am not going to be the driver for your team next year. Yeah, that was an iconic moment. Rewind to Oscar Piastri. Yeah. A couple of years a couple ago. Years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was epic. Mm -hmm. And Albon's follow-up using the same wording, confirming that he was re-signing at Williams. Yes, yeah. yes. All right, what else do you have from Formula One? Anything else? I think we're just down to four seats open for next year, assuming no weird Red Bull shakeups. True. 
Um, so those seats are starting to dwindle. It looks like, well, we've confirmed that Logan's going to be gone from Williams. Yes. Um, there are no more seats available at Williams. And it looks like Magnuson will also probably be dropped unless another team picks him up. Um, well, uh, Hulkenberg spoke highly of mm -hmm. Magnuson, was actually kind of lobbying for Haas to, to keep him. Which they didn't. Which they didn't. Those seats are full. So there's we still, still an Audi. We still have Alpine. Right. And so, well, does Hulk want Magnuson as a teammate? I, I don't know. He might have just been being nice in the press and it's like, no way in hell do I want that guy as my teammate. I went, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I mean, Joe, I've been hearing conversation about um, Mick Schumacher potentially going to Audi as an all-German lineup uh, yes. for a German manufacturer. True. Possibility. But I have not seen anything. But then again, they just hired a Italian as their team principal, so. Yeah, well, <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I mean, uh, silly season is under full swing, and mm -hmm. it's going to be worth watching during the summer break. Mm -hmm. NASCAR had an off week this week. They had an off week because of the Olympics. They have uh, another off week coming up. But the big news was Jimmy Johnson fired his entire team. What? 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 I did not hear or see anything about that. Yes. So Jimmy Johnson bought Legacy Motorsports from Richard Petty, basically, and, and whoever was Richard Petty's, you know, last partner. Uh, and, and he started the 84 team as part of that to run part time. He still has two or three more races on the schedule to run, but they let everybody go. After, Interesting. And, and yes. So was there any sort of announcement about what was going on or is he just doing a full Well, he well, so the crew chief he hired came from Junior Motorsports. Okay. So an Xfinity crew chief that mm -hmm. raced for Dale Jr.'s team, very successful. So did that, he stay or was he gone too? No, he's gone too. Oh wow. So there's some question as to, you know, why all that. I mean, he's been performing well, but he's been wrecked out of two of the races that he was running in also. Uh, he has admitted in a press conference that this has been a lot harder being a team owner than he thought it was going to be. And so he's probably going to rebuild the entire team, I, I'm guessing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, they yeah. also switch manufacturers too, which... Yeah, I wonder if it would have been almost easier for him to start ground up than trying to buy a team and kind of like Denny Hamlin did. Yeah. He started with uh, Michael Jordan. Yeah, Michael Jordan is his partner. 2311. Yeah. So Yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of big, big news. news in NASCAR. The other um fun little NASCAR tidbit that we have is um, like the, the BuzzFeed quizzes of, you know, 10, 15 years ago of, you know. What, what tree are you? Yes, exactly. Type, type thing, yes. NASCAR did a little, um, what driver are you and who else is in your garage? So we thought that we had to do that. Just and we will provide the link in the description so you can play this game also. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the link will be alive for, for a while. Hopefully. So I had a 62% match to Christopher Bell as my number one driver. And I think a lot of that on mine was that I listed, um, you had like underdog or veteran or like, you know, something else. And I put underdog and I feel like Christopher, Christopher Bell is always the underdog like of the playoffs. He always gets in. And he makes it further than anyone's expecting. He's made it to the final four the last two years. He's a quietly successful driver. Yeah. And I think that's the issue. He's a little bit like, if you remember when you were much younger, Matt Kenseth. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. Driving the same number, right? I think maybe, yeah. Was Matt Kenseth number 20 also? I'm trying to remember. It was with Roush Racing, but 
uh, I think it was. Okay, we're going to we have Google fact ones. check that right now. A few moments later. Oh, oh, he was 17. He was 17, that's right. I'll try to play an interesting clip while Kelly's searching that. Beginning in 2013, the number 20 car was taken over by Matt Kenseth, who oh. left Roush Fenway Racing as Joey Logano moved to the 22 at Penske Racing. Okay. So you, you were right. Just more recently. Then. Yes. So who else was in your garage? Okay, so who else was in my garage? So my next match was Josh Berry, um, who just moved up from the Xfinity Series this year. Yes. Right, this year. to Replace Kevin Harvick. Full-time cup ride. Um, I had a 58% match with him. And then Bubba Wallace and then Ryan Priest uh, rounded out my garage. And I think across all of those, it has to be the underdog theme. If there's anything to to pick out on why those four are grouped, yes, I think that's it. Yes. Um, of all the other questions, I would have no idea if there's any overlap between these drivers. Um, well, personality-wise, they don't seem to overlap a ton to me. No, and uh, and Bubba was your number two driver. Number three. Number three driver, yeah. and Bubba Wallace was my best match. Yes. Here's yours. Put on the glasses so I can actually see. So Bubba Wallace was a 62% match. And then, I, again, I think it was the underdog theme. And then I was also kind of the wily veteran because you had to ask, answer what kind of driver would you be. Mm -hmm. And so Todd Gilliland, whose father was a longtime journeyman driver on the uh, old Winston West series, now the uh, Menards West series, mm -hmm. And then Chris Boucher, who drives for uh, Keselowski uh, Fenway Roush Racing. And then Chase Briscoe from the now soon to be defunct Stuart Haas Racing Stable. So, hmm. but uh, yeah, Bubba Wallace was my number one most like me driver hmm. i would never have guessed that for you yeah and and i it maybe be, it's because he's never won a championship and we're doing the underdog mm -hmm. type thing i mean there's many more questions in there besides that right and he's always on the edge of the playoffs or just in the playoffs and scraping from one round to the other yeah and and so that might be he's part of that twenty three eleven team that is building from the ground up to try to win a championship. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I wonder if we had put, like, you know, veteran or something like that, if we would have had a stable of, like, all past champions. Yes. Or, or first fierce competitor. Although, yeah. fierce competitor was one of the choices, and I didn't choose it, I don't think. And I put Bubba under fierce competitor big time. That, mm -hmm. that, that guy does not like to lose. No. I mean, a lot of them don't like to lose, but he... Um, his m media classes didn't go quite as well as some others on how to hide your disappointment in your performance. Uh, because, yeah, his PR team has to work a little harder than some yes, of yes. <laughs> Because he just lets you know exactly how he feels the moment he gets out of the race car. I will say one thing I like about NASCAR over F1 is I feel like the media training is not done to the same extent that it is for f1 i feel like they are so heavily media trained in f1 yes. that there is like almost no slip up like they have the same canned responses in like every situation they never say anything interesting they don't do a lot they're that's always interesting. gracious about the guy oh i have to congratulate yeah you know yeah it's just like there's one playbook and every driver plays from it Yes. And you go to NASCAR and they, they might have one playbook, but the drivers don't use it. <laughs> it. It's it's not as colorful as it used to be because as more corporate sponsorship got into the sport, you know, they, they want their drivers to reflect well on the name that's on the car, you know. There's still a fight every year. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying that they're perfect, but I will tell you that there used to be more than one fight every year back in the day. And, you know, you had people like Jimmy Spencer who, oh, my God, was he colorful. 
it was always a lot of fun watching a Jimmy Spencer interview after a race, or for that matter, Tony Stewart. Mm-hmm. Tony Stewart did not put up with stupid questions from the media. And he, I mean, it was uh, Bill Parcell's level of scorched earth. Why don't you just write down what the future is for me, and then I'll, I'll conduct my schedule in alignment with that. I think the person in F1 for that was Kimi Raikkonen. Yes. And him retiring from the sport has sort of left that gap a little Except bit. for when they put a microphone in front of him, and he is still Kimi Raikkonen. That has not changed. Yeah. <laughs> He's just not on the grid to... <laughs> to, to get a weekly interviews. It's, yes. it's like, you know, two or three times a year, we kind of dust Kimi <laughs> off and bring him out in front, and then we remember why we don't bring him out in front and then send him back. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I. That is one of the things that that is more enjoyable. I mean, you know, the All Star Race at North Wilkesboro had a Jim Dandy fight um, after. Um, oh, Danica's old boyfriend uh, got wrecked by Kyle Busch, and then he couldn't get out of the infield because. There's no tunnel there. They have to drive across the track to get out. And so he got to sit around for like an hour and a half. And Was it Stenhouse? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Google. Stenhouse, yeah. And so he got to stew for an hour and a half. And <laughs> and he did not cool off in that hour and a half time. And, and uh, punches were thrown. Lots of punches. His father has been banned indefinitely from the garage area. That's awkward. Oh, well, that is awkward. Yes, that is awkward. Yeah. So, yeah, we still have colorful things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 120 degrees inside those race cars. and Yeah, they're not open air uh, cars. No, and, and uh, tempers get short in the heat. Yeah, well, especially on those ones when their cooling vests stop working. All right. The uh, the last thing that I have is, since I finally finished the Sarah J. Moss books, I got to go listen to the Two Girls, One Formula um, little mini-series that they did on the SJM books. So, it's another great worlds colliding. Um, and listen to probably, what, six hours? Over four episodes of their thoughts and theories and all of that related to the three series. Okay. So that was fun. And then... So mm -hmm. let me just say, if if you're a female viewer, which we don't have a yeah, lot of... Yeah, our grand total, 13% of you. Thank you for watching. Please keep watching. Tell your friends. We need more of you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> if you're interested in getting into Formula One... Yes. The Two Girls, One Formula podcast is probably the best entry drug mm -hmm. uh, for women in particular. I think they're entertaining for men to listen to, but they are really, they take a woman's perspective. They're uh, a girl's girl. Uh... And they have huge crushes on some of the drivers <laughs> and it, they are unabashed about their adoration. Mm -hmm. And when they get to get, actually get garage passes and, and go around, they, uh, their their uh, Instagram is just flooded with pictures, and uh, they're hilarious. Mm -hmm. They really are. So, and it's uh, a little bit race related and silly season, and and kind of the intricacies of that. But it's also what's the drama off the racetrack going on? Um, you know, what are drivers doing in their free time? Um, who are they dating? What's the wag situation? Yes. Um, oh, yeah. What's the fashion of Formula One, um, all of those sorts of pop culture things, they bring in a lot more. So they're on a lot of different uh, distribution systems for their podcast, but I'll put a link to a couple of them in the description this week. So mm -hmm. if you're curious and, you know, because Kelly has referred to the two girls several times yes. on these podcasts, you can tell she's a fan. <laughs> um, so, yes. So on the same thread. Well, I was going to say, you know, a little bit of a joke to the two girls. If you'd like to sponsor us, two girls, <laughs> uh, call us. Call us. <laughs> so 
on it was um, a running joke on their podcast for a long time yes they are sponsored now yes yes maybe someday yeah yeah um so august is uh read a romance book uh month and so they are taking a little twist on that and doing it as read an f1 romance book and so they have a mini series for August that they are releasing an interview with an author every weekday throughout August, which makes sense. It's summer break, not a lot going on. Um, and so they're doing a bunch of interviews with authors who have written F1 romance books. There are F1 romance books? And apparently enough of them to do an episode a weekday for the month of August. Color me baffled. <laughs> No idea. So, I'm looking for that's forward. a genre I would have not known existed. Oh, there's whole like sports romance as a like genre as a whole. There's a whole thing. There's a bunch of hockey ones out there. Um, I'm sure there's others, but I the ones that I see pop up like in my explore page and whatnot are either F1 or hockey. It seems like. Okay. Did Carrie Underwood write any of the hockey ones? Uh, not as far as I know, unless she used a pen name. Okay. Well, possibility. It's a possibility. Wow. So. I learned something new today. And at my age, that's hard to do. F1 romance books. Oh, there's a nice little. <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to do a screenshot <laughs> and, and try to drop that into the video so you can see. How many pop up with one search. You know, this might be our only chance of increasing our female audience. <laughs> I think the SJM part helps. It's at least a female author with a female main character. Yes, and, and uh, since we started talking about Sarah J. Moss, you keep on using her initials, and then I have to keep on letting people know who that really is. Mm -hmm. Our female viewership has gone up by two percentage points. It's so sad. So it's moving the needle. from. 89% male to 87% male? Yes. Hmm. Okay. That's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hey, but we're still rocking a good 7 8% of uh, viewership from Great Britain, so we appreciate that. <laughs> That's gone up too, because that was like 5% when we yes. first made that joke. Yes. About our our UK viewership. So when the Premier League kick start, starts up in a couple weeks here, uh, you will have Premier League content on this podcast, <laughs> my British friends. So uh, hang with us. We're here for you. Not just Formula One. You probably get bored to tears when we talk about NASCAR, but when we talk about Formula One, you're there with us. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the Premier League also. I'm just trying to do a little foreshadowing of things to come. Mm -hmm. Look, I didn't have a lot to talk about in this episode, so I'm just going to go on these little... Random tangents? Yes. Okay. Well, you can always cut them if you need to. That's more fun just to leave this, the craziness in. Bonus episodes. Yes. Yes, that we do have some bonus. Uh, we do have a couple episodes that are going to come out eventually as bonus episodes because we went on really long tangents on a couple items and it, it the especially the last podcast would have been way longer than it was and so we'll release those as uh, this and that extras mm -hmm. some point down the road some point down the road when I feel better <laughs> and actually have the energy to go back and re-edit those so yes I think that's what I have I mean my daily podcast will be 20 minutes with an F1 romance author. The, yes. And so that's what you, you're looking forward to. I am still just Olympics. I did get three chapters into uh, Throne of Glass. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah J. Moss wastes no time diving right into the story and we're, we're racing right along. So yep. um, I have a feeling that if I get some quiet time this weekend, which um, my tax preparer probably would prefer I don't, and that I actually work on the taxes. Mm -hmm. um, I might actually 
whip through that book fairly quickly. Yeah, this one's still a normal length book. They yeah. get longer as you go. Yeah, well, one first step release. At a time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to doing some reading, not looking forward to doing my taxes. Did have a deferral, so you know. It, IRS, I, don't come at him. <laughs> I, I'm legal still as of now. Uh -huh, for another uh, month and a half? Yes. So, so Weston, if you're watching, <laughs> I really do intend <laughs> to get cracking on those. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I don't believe it when I see it. I really hate doing that. Just. Okay. Okay, on that note, I think we're done. So, we'll see you again next week for another episode of This and That. Until then, have fun. God, that was a terrible close. <laughs> Until then, enjoy the Olympics. Yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, she carried me on this one, folks. She carried me. Bye now. Bye now.